Pari Yerego Sereliner. Şaç Nargalçun Ser Nergaçan Hamar. Aysor Hayakitakan Usman Sırakira Badi ve Uni. Hürun Galelu Doktor Nona Şah Nazaryana. Hello and welcome to the program of Armenian Studies' first academic event of 2018. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Shah Nazaryan for accepting our invitation and coming to speak to us today about the politics of gender and gender equality within Armenia in the context of relations with Russia and the West. Nona is a social anthropologist and a senior research fellow at the Institute of Archaeology and Ethnography at the National Ac Academy of Sciences, Yerevan. She was also affiliated with the Center for Independent Social Research in St. Petersburg. And in 2017, she was a visiting fellow at the University of Stanford. Nona has written extensively on the issues of gender, war, migration, memory, and diaspora in the Caucasus. And so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Nona to speak to us all today. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you for this introduction. Thank you very much for coming. Um, uh, I will first, I will organize my lecture in the following way. I will first uh, talk about the, the subject and then I have plenty of uh, slides. Uh, I, will, I will comment them and then I will be happy to answer your questions. So, since late two, 2012, the term gender in the Armenian discursive space obtained a tremendous sensitivity, even became a uh, pejorative insult. Local conservatives stated that the term is associated with European values and that the entire discourse, discourse of, on gender equality can affect the future political developments. New conservatism, which is will uh, which I will name further anti-genderism in Armenia, is connected with the Russian political movements and can, can be dis considered as a realization of uh, the Russian, uh, Russia's smart or soft power. This is associated with the emergence of the Pan-Russian uh, Pan Parents Committee organization in five countries, Russia, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, Armenia, playing on patriotic feelings of citizens and chanting the ideals of the so-called Eurasian family. In particular, the Pan-Armenian Parents Committee arranged a variety of actions against gender law being interpreted as propaganda of homosexuality. Nuina Serakan Karos in Armenian. Russian influence is definitely there. However, this would be a simplification of um, what is going on. As far as some, offer, uh, some other key social actors are closely involved, such as local independent actors, NGOs, political elites, and other groups of individuals. Uh, and, and 2013, in that sense, was a milestone in the history of the, of the civil sector in Armenia. More than that, the backlash in this area, namely the emergence of gender ideology, quote unquote, as an enemy figure, has a strong transnational aspect, including among others, uh, Germany, France, and countries of Visegrad group. Um, so I, I, I want to tell you a little bit about political context of, uh, uh, of uh, in Armenia uh, and why actually I, I state that there is the soft power and the smart power coming from Russia is there. On September, 3, 2013, Armenia's President Ser Sarkisyan held negotiations with Russian President Vladimir Putin in Moscow. Immediately afterwards, while still in Moscow, Sarkisyan announced that Armenia would join the custom unions, the Mojani Soyuz, renamed later into Eurasian Economic Union, instead of signing an association agreement with the European Union. 
As the U as European Union Armenia negotiations on the association agreement had just been finalized six weeks earlier, Armenia was planning to initial the uh, agreement in November. Armenian president's statement was rather unexpected, especially considering previous statements by Prime Minister Tigran Sarkisyan and other officials about the impossibility of joining the customs union. After Serge Sarkisyan, Sarkisyan's U-turn, he started explaining that the decision was made because of Russia's strategic role in Armenia's security policy, including economic reasons. However, a variety of sources provides more plausible explanations. Russian pressure on Armenia, including threats to cancel security guarantees and an, an increase of the gas price, among other leverages. Um, for Soviet states, the Armenian, uh, among other post Soviet states, the Armenian case is quite special because of the uh, announced so called complementary political uh, politics uh, towards old Russia and new European Union allies. In Armenia, this is discussed in terms of hard geopolitical dilemmas, which brings, bring to the uh, pressing security issues in Armenia since independence, 1991. Fears of moral and demographic decline are linked to understanding of patriotism and lead to the idea that we should not jeopardize the national unity when there is an external, external enemy. The hot mainstream <coughs> national topics uh, our conscription army and pronatalism, reproduction of the nation and mobilization and mobilization around the specific slogans. It deals with family policy and special legis legislative measures to reduce and stop gender-based selective abortions as well. As a result of political manipulations, the term and its associated, uh, its associated discourses were in the focus of public debate and still carry a strong potential for conflict. According to alternative reports and announcements made by NGOs, attacks on gender and LGBTI community are seen as political technologies for destruction from the various important topics, namely electoral fraud in 2012, accession to the European uh, Economic Union in 2013. In this socio-political context of contested neighborhood, one can ask, is gender geopolitical? The events of last five years in South Caucasus suggest that the answer is positive. Some scholars, including Stanford-based historian Gail Lapidus back in 2000, argue that gender democracy became a crucial point of transition. Virtually no one from the West or East anticipated in the initial euphoria that gender issues would prove to be one of the most problematic aspects of the transition and indeed that political democratization and economic reforms might significantly increase rather than attenuate the gender asymmetries. Yet this has become the case in the countries of the Soviet Union, where women have, have not only become the majority of the unemployed, but have also become de depoliticized and are largely left out of the government political parties and the official public sphere. Soviet legacy was decisively denied, including the experience of so-called state-sponsored feminism with the policy of Novaya Zhenshina, new woman, um, and an ambitious attempt of destroying a patriarchal image of femininity, instead creating a new model of 
Soviet women, and Novy Bit, new mode of life, uh, with, with uh, this central slogan, Daloy Kuchene Rabstva, no to kitchen slavery. Those early Soviet experimental projects implemented by Bolsheviks could be described as the ones that failed overall. Independent Armenia, in its turn, has a history of ter terminological and word choice struggles during the formation of the discor discourse on gender equality and non-discrimination. So it's important to turn to the political transformations the term gender has undergone. The term was adopted and used with relative ease for, for about two decades after the signing of major documents which outlined the main anti-discrimination provision. Among others, the 1979 UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, uh, ratified by Armenia uh, in 1993. Uh, the 1995 Beijing Convention and the Platform for Action documents on mainstreaming gender issues. The obligations undertaken by Armenia after signing these documents have significantly changed the legislative framework. However, despite the high level of Armenian legislative liberalization, the, the, the laws often face resistance from below, quote unquote, as well as from the conservative segments of the Armenian elites and function, unfortunately, poorly. The turning point came in 2013, uh, I want to reiterate that, when chapters of an organization called the Par Parents Committee were launched launched in five countries uh, and to promote the ideals of the so-called Eurasian family. Under pressure, the Armenian government approved on May 20, 2013, the same year, amendments to the law on ensuring equal rights for men and women, with one of the main feats being the deletion of the term gender from all documents, including, by the way, including uh, academic texts, because in my institute we had this kind of unofficial, an unofficial rule that it's better to not use them in, in, uh, in titles, at least. Uh, since 2013, uh, the LGBT, LGBTI community and human rights groups have documented numerous assaults which are parts, part of an aggressive strategy by ultranationalists in Armenia and Orthodox clergymen in Georgia. Uh, in Georgia, they, they would uh, this announce uh, that their, their function, their agenda is to, quote, unquote, to I'm quoting, to purify public space from sin. In this aggressive environment, even the Armenian Apostolic Church began to look moderate on LGBT issues. Yulia Antonian, a specialist on religion uh, in Armenia, said that the Armenian Church preferred to leave gender issues in the secular sphere, which, however, resulted in it being privatized by a range of actors, including ultranationalist and Russian soft power agents. Anna Nikorosyan, former director of the NGO Society Without Violence, saw the rounds of gendered hysteria in the country as a Russian political method of tilting public opinion towards toward joining the custom union which is Eurasian Economic Union, instead of toward uh, an European Union Association Agreement. The notion of gender became a key battleground for producing new identity division and challenging the political status quo. 
children's rights and gay marriage became a Trojan horse of the gender debate, enabling anti-gender series to target a larger public audience. This way, conservatives tactically exploit moral panics. I, I, I borrowed this concept from Cohen, uh, who contributed it uh, in 1972. Um, Rearticulating Armenian genocide and other traditional themes embedded in popular common sense to advance their political agenda. Taboos related to gender issues are certainly linked to nation building. That's my point. As family remains seen as a unit and the basis of the survival of the nation. At the same time, they are also clearly the result of uh, Russian ideological and doctrinal pressure, and sometimes even of its hard power, which have had its dynamics through the entire period of transition and includes Russia's visible economic and military presence in Armenia and limitation of freedom that Russia, uh, Russia imposes. Admittedly, Armenia has a track record of yield, yielding to Russian prompts. As a result, this strife, uh, as a result of this strife, the term gender disappeared from the political legal field, echoing the Russian political rhetoric. In 2014, Russian ambassador to Armenia, to Armenia Ivan Valinkin, stated that there is a need to, I'm quoting, to neutralize the activities of those NGOs who drive a wedge in the Armenian-Russian relations, alluding to the introduction of repressive laws of the Russian model. Two years earlier, the, leg the, leg the legislative amendments in Russia enacted on November 21st, 2012, stipulating that NGOs in engaged in political activities and financed from the West should be registered as foreign agents. Foreign agents. Armenia did not consider adopting such, such laws. However, indignant patriots launched a furious homophobic and anti-NGO campaign aimed at intimidating uh, civic activists. So uh, demographic panics uh, uh, and how they are kind of uh, 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 performed or uh, presented, you can see on this slide, and we can come back to this if you, if you want. Reasons for the extreme politicization of some homosexuality can be found in the Soviet myth that homosexuality originated in the West. In the South Caucasus, the homophobic practices trace their roots to uh, leg legislature of Bolshevik and late Soviet period. During the Soviet times, male homosexual act was criminalized. This not only drew, drove LGBTI deep undercover exacer exacerbating the cover-up strategies, but also supported the development of hate speech. With no doubt, the law also had repressive policy function of controlling dissidents and supp suppressing any form of individuality uh, in, so in the USSR. For example, through application of this law, the famous movie di director Sergei Parajanov was straight-jacketed in order to obstruct his dissident activity. The legislation not only intrudes the privacy, but also intruded, sorry, but also becomes an effective form of legitimate public stigma. Fear of moral, uh, moral panic uh, 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 and demographic uh, moral, sorry, moral and demographic decline are going hand in hand with patriotic topics such as uh, army conscription and a pronatalist policy. 
the parallel between uh, LGBTI and the memory of the genocide was even explicitly made. Some LGBT people are even called Turks, which embodies image of a genocidal enemy, dramatizing the issue to extreme. A flyer on Pushkin Street in Yerevan, visible in 2013, proclaimed gender per per perversion is genocide. Groups like the Pan-Armenian Parents Committee argues that the gender equality legislation would not give unwarranted benefit to sexual minorities, but threaten the nation's survival, a powerful narrative in Armenian's public memory. memory. So I, I, I would like also um, to, to bring your attention uh, to the point that um, actually um, social media campaign, which uh, replicates this claim, including an online petition on the website, uh, change.org, uh, and one of those who signed the petition commented on the website that the use of the word gender undermined traditional moral values and predicted that homosexuality would become widespread and fewer children would be born. This will lead to, the, to a decline in our already weak demographic growth and given the military problems our state face, faces, it could threaten our national security, security, wrote the petitioner. According to a blogger who has played a leading role in the wave of protests against the legislation, soon we will adopt a law against discrimination and a law about ju juvenile just justice, juvenile justice, and these three laws plus anti-domestic violence law uh, together are very dangerous, according to him. We are moving towards Europe, but at the same time, we need to worry about preserving our national identity. Uh, the thing is what I wanted you to, to look closely at, that the Constitution previously was defining, uh, was defining marriage differently. And after this anti-genderism movement, after this uh, new, new conservatism campaign, the, the whole definition was, of course, under huge pressure, was uh, redefined, was changed, and uh, conservatives uh, would insist, they insisted to, def to define marriage as uh, a union between men and women. So, but by this, uh, yeah, I think it's obvious that it, it was kind of in sense of democratic progressivist policy, a huge step back. Uh, so, uh, with Putin, please. Uh, the thing is, the whole discourse is uh, changing now uh, because, and once again, why I still want to insist then that in, in Armenian case particularly, uh, the, the wind, let's say, comes from Russia. Uh, Valery Spirling uh, is a an anthropologist, uh, a specialist on gender studies, who described this and analyzed this phenomenon in Russia very, very closely, and we, we can find quite, quite good answers to our questions. What we see in broader context is the use of gender norms and sexualization in Russian politics in the Putin era. Putin uh, incorporates the term traditionalism, quote unquote, and patriotism in his, in his rhetoric using the gender role of the macho man, uh, which has been popular and is deep rooted in Russian culture as well as in Armenian. Uh, it's easy to observe the process of how he legitimizes his authority and normalizes some unusual means for its manifestation. 
it looks like these retrograde Russian gender ideologies are connected to the ideology of a special path of Russia, a put. Rejection of Western values, partly because of the differences in gender norms, is the core attitude with, within the very electorate that supports Putin. They appreciate him as a strong, independent leader who will protest, protect, sorry, protect them from the per, 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 pernicious influence of the West. In Russia, political actors incorporated gender norms in their authority building toolboxes because of the accessibility and resonance of these aspects of cultural identity at elite and mass level alike. Because machismo and hegemonic masculinity are the very core of patriarchy, they provide numerous ways to validate the notion that being a powerful man is a natural part of being a political leader. According to her, to Sperling's research, Kremlin political strategists and Putin himself have been making use of the deep-rooted stereotypes and gender norms that emerged in the 1990s. In her landmarking book, uh, Sperling examines how attitudes of masculinity, femininity, and homophobia can be used as political tool tools. Through three different cases, Sperling examines how the pro- and anti-Putin movements construct a gender-specific power discourse and finds that despite the political differences and the opposing values between the movements, they still use exactly the same rhetoric, which is particularly homophobic uh, in, that they, uh, in that they humiliate their opponents by questioning their masculinity. She also introduces a detailed mapping of youth, youth political movements in Russia by analyzing pro- and anti-Kremlin organizations and support groups. Sperling explores the nature of political mobilization, participation in public events, and the political slogans of these, these movements, as well as the gender norms and symbols that the movements uh, use in their rhetorics. But why, why political actors rely on certain gender roles and models, and why these, the ideas of feminism and gender equality are not popular even among the most progressive uh, young politicians is a, a question for for separate research. So I, I, have, I come to conclusion. I want, I'm afraid I'm abusing time. Uh, and the conclusion is that since 2013, when Yerevan entered the customs union, gender issues became a crucial argument in all alleged East-West or Europe-Eurasia ideological confrontation. Armenian legislation as well as Russian one, provide, uh, according to some statistics, only for 7% rights protection for LGBTI, ranking these countries 47 out of 49 countries. And uh, Azerbaijan at the end of the list. Georgia is the leader in the region, holding the 30th position. The whole issue has become extremely politicized uh, and especially around the same-sex relationships acquired geopolitical twist. So the binary approach focused on men and women only makes LGBTI people invisible and ignores their rights, uh, realities, achievements, and challenges. To paraphrase Gramsci, Antonio Gramsci, the globalized neoliberal democratic order is in crisis, and as a new paradigm is struggling to be born, various morbidities are uh, allowed to rise to the surface. One such morbid symptom of this period of transition is illiberalism, a system which rests, 
rests on the rejection of civic liberalism but undermines democracy itself uh, in the process. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for being um, a little bit spontaneous, but I think... Yes, yes, we have time. Yes, yes. If you don't mind, I can go, yeah, go through slides. And yeah, I will be... Yes. I, and uh, I, will, I want just to, to make more salient my main, uh, my, my main arguments. So first of all, it, for me, it was very interesting, the process of this research, because I, I, I become from, being, uh, from thinking that it is so obvious that, that Russia is putting this ideological pressure for, for, cultural, for, for cultural hegemony and this, this we call it Piritiagi Kanata, this struggle for post-Soviet countries uh, and these countries are desired to be back. So Hillary Clinton calls that Sovietization, of Europe, creating European Economic Union, creation of economic, Europe, European, Eurasian Economic Union was kind of uh, obviously political act rather than economic, and, and this was just to, to manifest the, uh, the Soviet or post-Soviet values. So that was my, my kind of, not mistake, but later on digging, digging further, I just realized that this is actually quite a global phenomenon. And uh, in Germany and in France, there is a lot of, uh, there, is, there is almost the same uh, discourse, even though there is no this confrontation between East and West. So uh, it is not like the problem of West and the rest, but this is something to me, what, what is going on, what is happening now is very important because, what I, because of what I mentioned, this, the, the change of paradigm. So the whole progressivist democratic project is under under, threat, under the threat, it, it was, uh, it, it is kind of challenged, and uh, I'm sure that uh, I, I'm sure that counter strategies are very important, and I think that this this uh, social transformers or reformers they have has has to be have to be. Uh, sensitive to this critique to, to understand what can be changed, what can be done. So, next one, thank you. And so in Armenia, it all gets kind of even more dramatized because of this ongoing war with, with Azerbaijan. And uh, especially because, you know, this international organizations reports almost all of them, they start with the, with the sentence, um, uh, women in Armenia are economically dependent. So, and then, you know, it's, it's like, like main argument. Um, next one, please. But the thing is, we can, what we can see in Armenia, and this is almost like kind of international trend, feminization of NGO sector. Uh, and uh, which is uh, free of corruption and which is, uh, which is full of really greatly motivated people who are there for their principles. Next one, please. Um, yes, and as told, first 20 years, gender now, I, I, I've mentioned that gender mender, gender mender is an insult in Armenia. When, when somebody wants to say you are not normal, this, they say gender, gender mender. So, uh, and um, yeah, the, I, I, I think I talked quite enough about that. This is street, no problems. That was, that is, this is street graffiti where 
uh, where Putin actually kind of tries to act more sophisticated way, uh, the soft power. Nothing like that happened before. Next one, please. So, and you know, as, as again as told, this is a, a, a slide, uh, this is a picture from 1991, 1990, uh, Republika Armenia, Armenia uh, newspaper and you know the same problems come again and again and by the way join or die was taken this slogan was taken and, and this picture was taken from civil war uh, time in in the in in USA next one please and this is just joe geiropa geiropa is a pan word uh, because europa in Russian is Europe. And gay Europa means exactly articulating that, that the whole uh, vicious ideas come from Europe. Yeah, and uh, there was even this action that uh, people from Armenian names, uh, they were kind of, uh, uh, in void, uh, they came as emissars, as emissars. They arrived to Yerevan and they were talking only about this topic constantly. But next one, please. Yes, and this is why, you know, this is just to illustrate the idea that uh, Russia, uh, uh, Russia became to uh, combine both both strategies to to put pressure on Armenia, soft and hard power. So Kalashnikov is of course hard power, and we have a, a base, military base in Yerevan, in Armenia. Sorry, in Armenia, and uh, chocolate, Alyonushka is uh, is kind of soft power. Uh, yes, next one. And please, next one. Yeah, uh, DIU, do it yourself. Used to be a, a um, cafe in Yerevan for for LGBTI people, for for anybody who for progressivists, let's say. Uh, and this cafe, in the end, in late 2012, was blown up. And the the owner Somak, a lesbian woman who who moved to Armenia from diaspora, I guess, I guess from the U.S., she she was she just moved back. She left Armenia, uh, and the thing is exactly at that time uh, for for people who could critically think and analyze, it was so obvious that. Uh, not so obvious, but if if put some some effort to understand, uh, as soon as election starts uh, and pre-election campaigns, so that to to detract attention from fraud, etc., or corruption during election, something very dramatical and kind of. Uh, you know, somehow this was a very interesting psychological, psychosocial experiment, which worked perfectly, which worked perf perfectly because with very little cost, everything worked as new conservatives actually wanted. Next one, please, thank you. So a, a, a huge topic, if when, let, let me to be optimist, I, I can come next time. I would I would like to talk about the how this or this old struggle is uh, is performed in in education sphere. How textbooks again? There is a huge fight even for for changing just pictures in elementary school textbooks. Pictures where 
mothers always are washing dishes and fathers are always sitting in cozy armchair and reading newspapers. Just, just to change that is, is a huge problem. And, and actually the resistance frequently comes from, from below. The teachers themselves, women, they are not happy. They don't want to change that. And in that sense, just dialectically or paradoxically, call it whatever, <laughs> but, but sometimes some segments of elite, Armenian elite, political leading, ruling elite, are more progressive than, than the community uh, in its majority, of course. Next one, please. Uh, this person, Boshoyan, really, uh, he was actually absolutely aggressive, I mean, especially, uh, especially about changing curricula, uh, bringing this uh, pedag pedagogy of diversity into, uh, into school curricula. Yeah, next one, please. So there are a lot of challenging questions, to be honest, because first of all, uh, first of all, the st status of men in Armenian culture in, and in many patriarchal culture, Armenia in that sense is not an exception, but uh, uh, the status of men is very high. There are economic reasons. There are uh, ideological reasons, uh, even though physical strength and economic success is now are not connected to being male or female still. Uh, and, um, but at the same time, Armenia is under, not under, not pressure, but kind of pressure, but uh, being, being, having this, uh, um, driving this policy of complementarism, trying to be economically with European Union and, and sending that message in all, all possible levels uh, and, uh, being, uh, and, and being be, uh, calling Russia a strategic partner. Uh, it, it is all about this security dilemma. Uh, and so uh, in, in 2013, it didn't work. But the good news is that in 2017, in November, I don't know, this is maybe a genius of Serge Sarkisian, but, but the thing is, this time he signed this association agreement and actually policy of complementarism worked out. So, but at the same time, the police reform and reformation of these male institutions, bringing there more women, and especially uh, pushing women to be uh, uh, to be part of you know, this siloviki, we call it uh, this this, this uh, totalitarian institution. I, I, I'm a little bit not critical about that. Not no, I, I just think that theoretically, from the point of view of feminist theory, it is very difficult to uh, um, to analyze and to interpret. Next one, please. Next one. Yes, and every time when the, when the um, situation in, in, uh, along the contact line gets, um, uh, gets uh, let's say, uh, war starts, let's say war starts, and all these, all these ideas, they get again, they, they, they get extremely dramatized again. Next one, please. Yes, and after April war, you know what happened, the, the rating of Russia, Ar Armenia, and especially de facto Nagorno-Karabakh uh, are actually quite pro-Russian, pro and they are like 50-50. Uh, 
but still, uh, after April war, that rating a little bit dropped down. Next one, please. Yes, and one of the very painful issues in modern Armenia is that uh, uh, we have second after China uh, uh, rank in, in rank of countries uh, who employ these sex selective abortions. Armenia is number two. Last, uh, last data says um, uh, Azerbaijan is now number two, but in Armenia there is one, one uh, Mars, one district, which Gerakunik, which is number one in the world on on sex selective abortions. So uh, uh, I have to be frank and to say that actually government put lots of lots of efforts to change the situation, and the the law was adopted in 2016, uh, and doctors were banned to tell during the echo. And by the way, this is also a very interesting fact that this is a, maybe, I think, I'm sure this is a heritage of Soviet Union, but uh, echo, uh, extracorporal sonography is quite accessible for all classes, uh, social classes. And, and this is why they immediately, on, on very early stage, can, can uh, can know the, the what, what sex is for ethos and and get rid of girls. So uh, yeah, it doesn't work properly this law, uh, uh, but still. Next one, please. Yeah, and domestic violence. Domestic violence, anti-domestic violence law, was attacked uh, attacked by these new conservatives. And so one can say, this, you know, who, can, who, can, uh, who can advocate for domestic violence? Nobody, but still, because they bring this child, by the way, in Europe and Visegrad group countries, the same situation. They just um, uh, send, put to center the child in, in danger sexualization and uh, and uh, ju ju you know, just justice etc and and uh, showing terrible social so social advertisements and videos how in in we in the west western countries children are taken from from their parents etc etc uh, so this of course uh, affects people very much Next one. Yeah, this is. I just wanted. I just wanted to to re reiterate that the situation of war actually for this for for this for, pre, for, for proliferation of these uh, uh, discourses is, is very is, is quite terrible because uh, even in Nagorno Karabakh we see that. You know, because because existential threat is always there, contact line and, and ongoing war. So only strong men like Putin, KGB men, yeah, kind of it's better them to be uh, in power. Next one, please. Is yeah, here is here is this explan just explanation. I can send you if if you want. And next one, I just want to leave a little bit of uh, room for ans for questions. And this is, you know, it's it's very funny. Uh, this is how you, you you maybe who who was who has been in Yerevan, you you remember this uh, Mother Armenia. Mother Armenia was replaced. Stalin's monument was replaced by this monument. Uh, and the same happened in, in, in Georgia. And you see this virilized image of Armenian woman 
um, yeah, very, very strange position of sword, etc. But what I mean to say is that even uh, you know there is not there is no many monuments of women, real women in Armenia. It's very hard to find. This is like the image of all Armenian women, so uh, reproductive, uh, reproductive uh, uh, value and uh, mother of nation, etc. This is just manifestation of that. But Zabel Yesayan, there is no monuments. I don't know, Silva Kaputikyan, Lots of women, real women, you can see them in public, in, in public commemoration or public space. Next one, please. Yeah, and actually, yeah, uh, I am proud to say that in Armenia we have tiny, very tiny, but very, very uh, efficient, effective NGO sector. And these two uh, brave women they uh, recently, on February, February 13, uh, they, uh, they went to mayor building and uh, they, they actually wanted uh, Taron, uh, the, the mayor of Yerevan, to, to smell uh, sewage. sewage water from Nubarashen. And they were beaten by, uh, by security and other male politicians and uh, you know uh, echoing that uh, most of male politicians they actually were trying to uh, defend uh, mayor and you know to blame these women next one please so uh, this slide is is uh, again street graffiti from uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University uh, in, in Delhi. Uh, if you sexist me, I will feminist you. Okay? Okay. So, uh, yeah, it's just to say that uh, my, my understanding is that uh, gender education, which is now under threat, could be a uh, not shortcut, no, it's not shortcut way, but it would be tangible way to change this value, uh, patriarchal value, domination of patriarchal value uh, in Armenia. Uh, yeah, but unfortunately, uh, there are a couple of facts that hinder this process. One is that Usually, the signals come from uh, European Union or UN organizations, and until now, before uh, signing the document, European, European Union Association Agreement, uh, before that, those signals or those recommendations had, how to say, recommendation character. They had no implementation power. And this is why every time the government or governmental structure would say yes, 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 sure, and nothing would happen. And now I, I still, I, I, I feel like I hope that something will really change. Uh, and the thing is, Source Foundation already spent just a lot of money for Putin to, for making uh, gender, to, to, for bringing gender sensitivity component in higher school education, a million of dollars, and, um, and unfortunately it it doesn't work well because of I think my idea, my assumption is because of this key, uh, brain drain. I, I think in to start that in elementary school would be crucial would be essential. And next one? Yes. And thank you very much. This, this is not slide. This is caricature, caricature from, uh, if somebody is doing Soviet studies, this is 
very, very, um, how you call it, uh, textbook film from Soviet Union. And this is Margonov, Russia, and uh, Nikulin and Witsin in the middle, but Ukrainian flag, you can easily just replace it with Armenian because the situation is actually the same, but with more dramatical, uh, dramatical consequences for Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thank you for your very insightful talk, Anna. Um, so as the chair, I will allow to offer anyone a chance to ask their questions, but I'm going to abuse that in regular fashion and ask my own question first. Um, I was quite interested in the, the aspect of how gender, gender identity relates to the army in Armenia. As you said, there's conscription and family values are seen as fundamental and key to the preservation of Armenia. Um, do you know if there are any, um, this is my pure ignorance, I don't know if there are any laws prohibiting women from being in the army or even those who, who are not straight, for example, who um, associate themselves in the LGBT uh, category. Um, do you know of any laws or any other direction of general conversation in that regard? Yes, uh, yeah, this is very a very vibrant uh, sphere and in the very beginning, let's say, I started to monitor that uh, in 2011-12 in Nagorno, in Karabakh, in de facto Nagorno Karabakh, and it, it seemed at that time that the pressure mostly comes again bottom from bottom from so soldiers like this we call it in Russian didavshina or bullying in army. I don't know how this, this very strange phenomenon with this Freudian sentiments like repetition compulsion. And um, so soldiers, they, they would make this kind of uh, bullying and pressure and, and even if even the person like uh, was not really even, there was, uh, there was no uh, recognizing of being gay, but still there was a lot of pressure like that, stigmatization, etc. But uh, later on, yes, you are right, two directions were kind of, uh, Nagorno Karabakh government was very strict about that. One is uh, Yegova witnesses um, because they actually uh, they mm, talk about pacifist ideas and values and they, 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 they want for themselves al alternative uh, alternative cons conscription conscription uh, they don't want they, they refuse to take weapon. Uh, and the second, the second one was just if, if somebody uh, uh, announced, like coming out by saying that he is gay, then he can avoid uh, conscription. And this is again, you know, uh, <laughs> this is very interesting again because some people just play with that to mm -hmm. avoid. To yeah, avoid. Like, I've heard in Turkey. Yeah, I was about, no, no, I was about to say the same thing. Please. I have to submit a video of, um, like, video or pictures. Of to prove. Yeah. Um, um, to prove that you have the gender identity in order to avoid the um, um, military service. I don't know if say No, it's not the same. <laughs> <laughs> just, <laughs> just coming out is <laughs> enough. Uh, yeah, but the thing is, I, I have to say that there are dominant discourse and there are marginal discourse. And I was happy just quite recently, I, I, I figured out that in some villages of, of Armenia, small villages, there are new trends. People want to have daughters rather than sons 
because at least they will survive. <coughs> so, you know, I, I, I started to, to believe to human rationality. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Um, are there any questions from the floor? Yes. Um, Sorry, one minute, I need to get a microphone. Um, where do you think international organisations should best put their resources into supporting women's and LGBT rights in Armenia? Why they should do? Uh, what, where can they best help support this progression? Yeah, how can they do it? Where should, what, mm -hmm. what should they do? Yeah, um, yeah I, I, I really believe in, in school. Uh, curricula changing mm. this mm. school curricula uh, because you know the whole society is you know th this is just pri primordial kind of belief and you know th the reaction is very strong so it should be done I think we have to work inside we, we need we need consultation consultations and uh, we, we don't need to invent bicycle again, but we, we have to work inside with help of organization. I think consultations uh, would be great uh, help, which we have actually. Thank you for the presentation. Um, do you think it will be because I was just wondering, obviously, um, it's entirely right to, to say that um, the situation of, L of, of the term gender, you know, sexually alternative of LGBT people in Armenia, um, is a result of, we could say, post-Soviet Russian propaganda as well. But would you think it's useful to discuss um, the fault of the West? Because I, I have a feeling that Yes, people say that, oh, the West is doing, that, you know, this is Gevropa and, and, and things like that. But it's true. The, the, the West always picks on um, Eastern nations, uh, whether they be Middle Eastern or post-Soviet or behind the Iron Curtain, for certain things. They pick certain, for example, women's rights, LGBT rights, I don't know, um, sort of liberalization, privatization, things like that. Um, I'm not saying that there's something wrong with the term um, with with equality, and absolutely not. You know, there's nothing wrong with the term gender. There's nothing wrong with the with gender studies, and there's nothing wrong with LGBT rights. But at the same time, as um, gender rights and LGBT rights are being politicised in um, the former Soviet bloc, they are also being politicised in the so-called West, like Western European countries, and whenever um, these impoverished countries such as Armenia um, need some favor from um, the European Union. They always lay out conditions. So in a sense, it is true, it, it is, it, you know, people are not wrong saying that um, uh, this is a propaganda, because it is a propaganda, politi politicized. That gender issue, I mean, I don't know how to elaborate, I'll probably sound very um, stupid at the moment, but gender issues are politicized in the West vis-a-vis -vis, um, so-called Eastern nations. So I think, well, do you think it will be useful at the same time to talk about how um, Western European nations or let's say Western nations attack um, Eastern nations, like what they exactly do to, to pick on them as well as how Russia uh, politicizes gender issues and LGBT rights in the opposite direction in future, I mean, uh, discussions on this topic. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. This is a very interesting question and quite difficult as well. So I, I totally, first of all, I have to deconstruct your whole question by saying that I don't believe that there are. Western, Western countries and Eastern countries. I mean, in sense of you know, human rights are the same everywhere. I don't think that West invented human rights. That's not true because we have moral compasses inside of us, and we know that 
something is wrong with what is going on in gender relationship, in male-female relationship and division of labor in family, outside of family, etc., etc. But the thing is, I, I totally agree with the second part that if, if, let's say, Western countries, they push that agenda of gender equality, they absolutely must be, should be, maybe must be sensitive to social context. I will bring you one example, historical example. This is just miracle that we, we have this uh, evidence. But this is because the, the case was, in, the, the woman was sued and the, the um, interrogation was recorded. So, uh, what happened in Turkey, in Ottoman Empire, after British pressure to, to give, uh, to, give lib to liberate women? Women, lots of prostitutes, lots of prostitutes became, uh, normal women became prostitutes because patriarchal system has this kind of functional system still you know it's the, yeah i can only refer and send you to read this article written by satani shami uh, she's a specialist on on caucasus in new york and she just explained that links you know and the same here but at the same time standards are important right i my personal understanding is that Turkey, if we take Erdogan's speeches before 2010, European Union, Europe, European Union, content, very easy content analysis, frequently, quite frequently, he was repeating that because there was this eager to be part of Europe and then frustration. After 2010, Islamic, Islam, our values, our, we, our. I think that something like that happened with Russia because standards are too high. But at the same time, can we give justice or equality to one part and ignore another? To, to my uh, to, to my view, with, uh, my opinion, my understanding is that the most discriminated group of hu human beings on the planet are women, because it is you know there were uh, there were states where gay culture was normal, like in ancient Greece, etc. But women. For thousand years, nothing changed. Still now, BBC pays quite great salaries, but still women get, for the same work performed, they get a little bit smaller salaries than women. What I mean to say is this omnipresent, you know, it's just, it's so huge, that problem problems of, I don't make them small, not at all, but black, gay, ethnic minorities, that all is nothing compared to, to this. I mean, there are this theory of Crenshaw uh, intersection, mm -hmm. you know, yes. s lesbian, mm -hmm. black mm -hmm. woman is the most, you know, discriminated. But still, women is something really big and fundamental and you know to take this to face this challenge yeah i think it's very important um, thank you if there are no other questions i see one more hand um just out of interest are there um i know recently in russia there's been a resurgence of or not resurgence surge of um written feminist discourse is the same thing happening in armenia over the last, say, couple of decades, are there lots of Armenian feminist thinkers coming to the fore? A resurgence? Uh, like, oh, sorry. 
Yeah. 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 I would say vice versa. <laughs> you know, I, I actually, I, I, I was thinking about this. Is not spontaneous. What I'm trying to say, that, you know, there is a reason why, in all post-Soviet countries, feminism is tremendously unpopular. And the reason mm. I think is in Bolsheviks and Soviet policy and this Soviet-style state feminism incorporated in the very beginning, by the way, it was like scientifically kind of on the edge, avant-garde of science to, to change everything, to break. But the, the problem, it, 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 may, it had all chances to be successful, but the problem was that feminist project was competing with modernization project. And for Stalin, strong man, modernization was far more important than women issues. He immediately, he immediately canceled abortions, which is backlash, and, and you know, a lot of things, you know, it's, it's very obvious that women, they were used again to push modernization projects. And this is actually why feminism is so unpopular. Because Novy Bid, Daloy Kuchana Rabstva, it was all ignored later on. But what virtually they got double, triple burden they were doing all reproductive, invisible work at home, no help, neither, neither from state nor from husbands, and productive work, being visible in public and doing, really having, not, not being weak, weak sex. Now, it was too much, and now they actually, it's sometimes so, so um, vocal, we want to enjoy patriarchy. Th this is the message. You know, we, don't, we want to be women, patriarchal women, sit down and waiting when men being breadwinners, quite a difficult function. So this is, you know, I, I, we can go and go on with, on that, but this is such a long topic. Yeah. Yeah. I would be happy to continue. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for coming along to this lecture. And a massive yes, thank, thank you, you to, your time. to you, Dr. Shahna Zayan, for this really interesting talk. I really appreciate it. Um, to all those people watching um, on our YouTube channel, um, stay tuned to our newsletter. More events coming soon. Uh, thank you very much.